tips and tricks for writing design research. I'm going to provide some practical insights on how I write, why do I write, for what reason do I write. But before I go into that, I want to contextualize why is that so important. Well, in the last decades, design in general has prioritized functional form. As an example, I give you this uh, collision between a contemporary car that is designed for maximum, maximum um, driver's safety. And on the other side, you see an uh, old-fashioned car designed for maximum styling when the design was concerned with form. And every car was so different from each other because they wanted to distinguish themselves by having this almost alien design. Well, this is currently not just something that has shifted in automobile design. We can see all around us regarding digital technologies, for example, function is much more important and deserves like usability and user experience studies. But as implying this shift uh, between form and function, it's also there is an ideology of transparency behind it. The design tries to make the objects and the services that is, are being designed to be transparent in giving access to the world without having any stake or influence. So design try to stay behind uh, or beyond or somewhere hidden so that people would not pay attention so much to design. So design would not stand in the way of the user's tasks. A movie that depicts this shift so clearly is Minority Report, a movie about a world where mass surveillance became available. And this surveillance was managed through these transparent interfaces that at that time were quite visually compelling, even though the whole point of the them was that you would immerse yourself in the world instead of getting yourself out of that world in a virtual reality. Well, this movie, anticipated many trends in what came uh, later on known as clean design or um, user experience design. So this um, focus on transparency became uh, uh, commonplace in user experience design and many other fields. But a point behind it is somehow missed in this conversation is that there are some designers designing those interfaces, but if they are not uh, if they need to stay out of the way with their interfaces, it seems like they have nothing to say. So there's no content in those transparent design interfaces. Well, is that really so? If we compare to other culture me media products of that time, for example, when Jonathan Ive was the vice president of Apple, every new product that came out of the market was accompanied by a movie where he was explaining the best features of the designs, uh, how they came up with that form uh, or even that function. But this uh, is not something that uh, the general public was used to understanding and thinking about design in terms of being authored. So everyone started to uh, flock around Jonathan Ive as the one of the very few designers, uh, authors, or star designers that people knew about because most products, they come maybe with a brand designed by Apple, but you don't usually see designed by Jonathan Ive. Well, actually with Apple, you would see them in the videos, but with most companies, you would never know who were the authors of those interfaces. And even so, a lot of people became to be more literate about design uh, as a form giving activity and they could recognize that it was different kind of languages being used by design that were not reliant solely on written characters. For example, the iconic languages they use in interfaces and buttons and all kinds of product surfaces, but also shapes, uh, grammars and different kind of uh, textiles and, and even sound became understood as a part of uh, design languages. But even in this, by recognizing language use and associating that with design, designers were not necessarily being uh, 
treated or recognized as authors. And the reason for that is that not like every company lacked a leadership like Jonathan Ive. <laughs> it's the opposite of that. The, the thing is that most companies didn't want to have someone from design at the top because designers were mostly exploited as cheap labor, as cheap source of labor. And Jonathan Knife is just an exception in this uh, organization and valorization of uh, design work. And um, if we look historically at the history of design work, we can see that most of times it's considered to be labor and concerned with function and reading instead of uh, writing, instead of form, instead of work. All of this left side in this uh, dichotomies concerns the privileged side. The people that are doing work uh, concerned with form, with writing, criticism, science or theory, they are well regarded in society, where people that are concerned with labor, function, reading, creativity, technology and practice are considered to be in a less privileged or underprivileged side of society. And this distinction, this dichotomy between social groups used to uh, justify, for example, exploitation. And for example, we could say that people that are doing what is on the right side of this uh, dichotomy are basically doing less valuable work and therefore they deserve less compensation for it or they deserve less recognition because it's not so important. And yeah, this pervades every kind of institution in our society, not just companies that do design products, but in design research, we can uh, change that or challenge that because designers who come from our experience on the right side, they can go to the left side of this equation and they can say their word, they can't labor communication. With that, I'm inspired by Paulo Freire, this marvelous Brazilian educator who wrote about the importance of becoming more literate about your world to change that world. So design research is that kind of opportunity and learning how to write in just the different ways. And there are actually many different ways of writing design research. For example, we could write questions, hypotheses, and define our interests. But then we observe, we interview, we have workshops with other people, especially users. And from there, new insights, needs, ideas, concepts, ways of making and changing the world arise but we have to interpret and analyze and check for biases and potential overlooked things because we are part of a community of uh, design researchers that are interested in seeing what we've got and then we have to present, discuss and co-create. And af after we do that, we get new questions, hypothesis, interests. I'm just writing a circular uh, process here, but it could go in any other direction in a, uh, a non-linear way. That's the most common, actually, connection between those different activities. And in every one of them, the common uh, feature is that you have to write, but you don't write only with text. You may write with several different kind of languages, as I have mentioned before. Here are some pictures for you to understand and see this concrete aspect of writings in different media, and different styles, different genres. Uh, throughout my PhD. This is what I was doing when I was observing users, um, observing designers, architects, engineers, uh, healthcare practitioners, and even people on the um, on a open square I was observing and taking notes. And those notes were taken into notebooks, but also in post-its. And somehow I extend my understanding of design toward, toward uh, my understanding of writing towards including uh, video recording, I also see that as a kind of a writing and, and a way of observing and describing what's going on. And uh, the, those writings are connected pretty much like I'm, I show in the last slide, because we are dealing with this palimpsest, this evolving text that tries to make sense of this complex situation so where design research takes place. And if designer wants to become good writers and writing in so many different genres, they also need to become good readers. They need to practice reading this the very different kind of styles. However, reading habits may help or hinder design research writing. Here's myself. 
reading um, a paper in a marvelous place uh, and I was just having a good time and not many people can read like I'm reading <laughs> this well so some people reading is a ritual where they have to remove all kinds of distractions around them they need to be pretty focused and having for example sitting down straight with a spine straight and and looking at the at the text and nothing else but for me I can get sleepy if I'm doing that. I need to have pleasure while I'm reading, and that's why I'm adapting my reading habits to fit my own constitution and my, my practice of enjoying text and enjoying nature. But every person has a different one. And if you try different things, you will see that some reading habits will be uh, uh, constructive, other will be destructive. <laughs> uh, for example, I lost some eyesight after reading in the dark for many years doing my PhD and now I'm wearing glasses and before that I didn't need that because of my uh, bad reading habits I learned the hard way <laughs> of reading in better environments well perhaps I didn't learn so much but what I want to say is that becoming reflective about reading habits is very important to become a good reader and get the best of your readings there are some other ways beyond habits that can structure your reading. Uh, for example, literature review, also known in design research as desk research, is a method that you can organize reading beyond your habits, so you do not uh, stick to those preferences or like and dislike, because you can also disclose um, a literature review process or method to, the, uh, to your readers when you're writing about what you have done. And other people know those methods so they can scrutinize and check whether you have read in a good way or in a bad way. So you have overlooked something or whether you have covered the topic in full ex to, the, to its full extent. So you can, for example, do a very simple literature review method. Get, grab all the books on a bookshelf about a certain topic in the library or in your personal library. And then you make up something out of those readings. You write a summary and a discussion of those different uh, texts. What, what, what were the major takeaways and how those different readings intersect or challenge each other? That's, in a nutshell, what a literature review is about. Of course, if you go through online search, you can find even more uh, materials to compare, to analyze. In, in, in if you type some various, uh, if you type certain topics that are vague, like who am I, <laughs> uh, you won't find so many results. It's a bit more difficult uh, to uh, answer those philosophical questions. But then if you drill down using some uh, uh, selection criteria, then you get something more specific. For example, you're interested on anything that was written about this between the 1980s and 1990s decades. So this is one of the options, one of the few options that Google Scholar offers. There are other search engines that offer much more options for drilling down, for filtering out your results and getting some more specific uh, things that you can also handle. Because for example, in this particular example here, I got, I've got 418,000 results, which is perhaps too much to analyze in a literature review. So the good uh, literature review is perhaps reduced to a, a certain amount of text that you can read within the lot of time you have for conducting that research. And was, while you, out, you start doing this kind of a search engine uh, uh, browsing, you will find out there are more papers than books. And if you are new to design research, you might wonder why is that so? Well, I've got here some uh, numbers, some figures that you can use to interpret that and answer that question. In looking at my average publishing times, all of the papers that I have written in days, you will see that conference papers, they get out in the world, in public, much quicker than book chapters, for example. And I haven't, um, I haven't written and published a, an entire book in English yet to compare this, but even writing a book chapter is already more than a year long time to get there and a conference paper can be out in, uh, I don't know, about half a year or so and the journal article stands in between. Sometimes 
it has the largest uh, variety of time spans but even so uh, book chapters take longer and if conference papers take quicker take less time they would show up more in research results and why is the journal article the most interesting uh, format for research because it's in between um, uh, of these two extremes the book chapter that is less structured and the conference paper on the other side which is more structured well the journal article or the scientific article in general that can also be um, presented in conference some conferences require the scientific article structure by the way they both have this kind of uh, very structured uh, text writing even the abstract has to follow some kind of rules for presenting the content most uh, scientific articles they have an abstract an introduction a methodology results section and discussion and reference list and the reason why is that because can help comparing different articles but also indexing in search engines like Google Scholar. Google Scholar is already trained to find references in the reference list and so on and so forth so you can have a better um, collective uh, knowledge accumulation activity which is the uh, goal of any science. And this structure is also shaped by the normative or so-called this scientific method that is typically uh, involving a process of observing the world, questioning the world, generating a hypothesis that explains what's going on in the world, predicting what's going to happen in the future if you run an experiment and try to change the world, see the results of it, maybe you reject the hypothesis because it didn't work as you expected and then you have formulate another one and go through this process again until with, from the results you derive a theory that explains that and you can observe and extend further the evidence that supports and backs up that theory. So this process can be uh, organized or uh, structured into these three major sections, like introduction, methodology, results, and conclusions, four sections actually. And that's how the scientific uh, article got its own structure from the scientific method uh, traditional process. Nowadays, and yeah, for so many years already, scientific methods are not so linear, not so simple, with there are many ramifications, and therefore this the scientific article structure is also pretty varied. And you can find articles that would talk about results before talking about methodology, for example, if it's important for making sure that people understand what is this paper about. And there are many situations where it's going to be hard to um, distinguish what is what. So you will have an information that is part uh, theory, part method, method, and then you cannot detach them from together, and it's hard to structure the paper. That's why this paper structure is just um, a suggestion, and it's hardly ever uh, mandatory for writing a scientific article. But even if it's not so structured, every scientific article tries to pack a lot of information to a small amount of space. That's why it's often necessary to reread until you understand it. And every time you read, you get better at reading and you understand better the topic because you're not reading the text for the words or for the sentences or for the content. You're really reading the text to get acquainted with this collective knowledge accumulation activity, which is the science behind it. And similarly, a scientific article requires rewriting the same sentence, paragraph, or title several times. So it's a very daunting task, this process of redoing every time you reread and then you rewrite. However, you get better results and you get more specific with your language. And while you rewrite, of course, there are some jokes and memes about this. Um, here you can see. Uh, I, a person was thinking, I don't know anything about this, um, and wrote that kind of thing on the paper. But if that person becomes a little bit more uh, acquainted with the way how papers are written, the person would rewrite as this is beyond the scope of this paper. <laughs> and it's, it's like more precise for sure, because you are not saying so much about yourself, you're saying so much more about 
the science behind it and the role of this paper in this whole collective activity of uh, knowledge accumulation. So it's beyond the scope of this paper, but maybe it's part of the scope of another paper written by another author that you may even reference. So yeah, it's it has a purpose. It's not a useless thing to be rewriting and polishing the discourse. And because rewrite is an opportunity to reread and cite relevant work. While you consider that, do I really know? Well, maybe I don't know, but someone else says no, then I should, it's beyond the scope of this paper, but the other paper has written about it. And it's the moment when you recognize uh, and are recognized for your scientific work. The citations spread across the text, those um, uh, names that you can see inside brackets in, in, in papers, they are, yeah, they, they are the, the they are the most important recognition devices of uh, scientific accumulation, collective accumulation activity. However, citing other authors does not guarantee that you're going to be cited. And here's just a quick um, survey of my own papers. The most cited papers, they have uh, they have less references than the least cited papers, meaning that. Um, if you assign a lot of people, it doesn't mean that you're going to get a lot of references. Well, there's not a direct correlation between those numbers, but as you can see, the number of uh, citations that I receive on my papers is less than what I give to other papers by now, in this current moment. Of course, this may change in the future, but we don't, do, we don't cite other papers because we want to be cited. That's not the purpose of it. We want to recognize good work and and if our work is considered to be uh, good, it may be referenced or maybe not, because there's also always a controversy about what is uh, good research. And that decision of what is good and what is bad or what is worth of being recognized is uh, influenced by a lot of oppressive relationships, historical relationships of oppression. For example, there's quite some research showing up that um, research done in the global south or by the oppressed authors in general, they suffer from citation inequality or in citation injustice, meaning that our oppressed authors get way less citations than uh, oppressors authors or people that are on the privileged side in their many different relationships. And here are a few of those relationships that can be taken into account. Typically oppressed authors are, they do counter-hegemonic research and therefore they are uh, considered to be doing something irrelevant, useless, or even something to be politically persecuted because they are doing ideological work and not really scientific work. That's how uh, many of these oppressed authors are framed. And this is correlated or typically those categories are uh, accumulated. And, and these authors, they suffer also because they are located in the global south. They don't have a permanent university position. They are non-white. They may be black, indigenous, and people of color in general. They are women, they are disabled, or they are uh, uh, people with other kind of situations where they could not reach to the um, top level of an academic position where they would be recognized as authors. Why citing the oppressed is so important? Because you can revert this epistemic injustice by citing the cytless. You could avoid the commonplace and explore ideas and concepts that are usually uh, neglected because they are put forth by people who are un uh, misrecognized. And yeah, it's also in a way of uh, seeking innovation from the margins where these contradictions of society are more intense and therefore there's more possibilities for changing and doing innovative work. However, citing the site list requires reading the least read, known, and commented text. And this becomes harder, but still very rewarding. I have a personal experience on joining the Alvaro Vieira Pinto Research Network, Hedi Alvaro Vieira Pinto, a Brazilian network of people. I would say even beyond Brazil, there are some Latin American people in general that are collaborating on recognizing uh, the work of this Brazilian philosopher who also works in Chile and um, produces some kind of original philosophy, but due to some political persecution, his works were lost and some of them are being um, discovered very recently. 
um, one of the major works that uh, were published only after his death is called the Conceito de Tecnologia. It's an incredible um, piece of, of, of techno philosophy of technology that anticipated in the 1970s what was only discovered and discussed by this uh, emerging field, science, technology studies, uh, 30 years later. And the, only, the difficult thing about studying this author is that he writes in a, a very, um, let's say, redundant philosophical language. He tries to be very plain. He doesn't like using complex philosophical language, and therefore he explains things in very much details, but then he's works become very lengthy. <laughs> For example, uh, Consciência e Realidade Nacional and even Conceito de Tecnologia, these, these two main works, they are yeah, plus 1,000 pages. It takes a lot of time to read and go through that. And, and since you are reading so much text, you may forget what you have read before. That's why you need to take notes of what you're reading. I'm taking this example uh, here now, uh, reading over Vera Pinto, but that's a general rule I use for any kind of serious reading. In the first read, I highlight sentences using a pen, a highlighter, summarizing main thoughts, and I also add a blank sticker for possible concepts. I don't write down what this concept is. I just mark that, uh, saying to myself in the future, hey, if you flip through this book later on, you might find this concept compelling. Well, it's a very subjective way you're reading because I'm basically uh, preempting my own thought in the future and I might get wrong. Sometimes I go back to those uh, blank stickers and I wonder why did I put it here. But most of the times I can re recall and it's a good opportunity for getting one of the key points of this reading uh, uh, well uh, defined or at least uh, well marked. On a second read, and those books, especially from Vera Pinto, they require so. I write labels of the main concepts in, in the stickers, but also I sometimes write uh, around in the, in, the, in the corners of the page. And I may even write some diagrams trying to make sense of this uh, dense philosophy. And a third read, which is already a write, so I'm already connecting and relating those different readings, I try to make sense visually uh, using conceptual maps or uh, IBIS systems, issue-based uh, information systems. And these systems like Compendium that I love to use and I use it for so long now since I started my PhD, they enable you to attach some notes to each of the visual icons that you put on the map and those notes can be quite big and you open them in a pop-up and you can uh, write down whatever you need there for later checking out. You can search those notes and use some kind of a database um, activities or functions to find out and relate those different information you are collecting there. Uh, but there is a kind of a methodology behind this uh, compendium software called dialog mapping. It has been developed for people who wanted to help people figure out how to deal with a contradiction in a discourse, in a, in a dialogue, in a conversation. So they would map uh, the main ideas, the pros and cons of the different ideas, the questions that rise new ideas, and so on and so forth. And this is called the um, IBIS notation. I use it in a in a flexible way. Sometimes I follow the notations, other times I don't. But the most important thing is that I use visuals to get this uh, overview, to get this bird view uh, perspective over the conceptual space that I'm mapping. And sometimes I use this uh, conceptual space as not just for uh, organizing my readings, but also to uh, structure my writing. For example, while writing the introduction to the Zenyan 22 a special issue on design and oppression and liberation together with uh, Rodrigo Gonzato and Leslie and Noel, I, did a, I made a map uh, on the major issues that came out of the papers in that special issue. I think we had between seven or eight papers in that issue. And I wanted, after reading them, I, I got the main issues um, visually together in this uh, circle in the middle. 
And I started to look at these issues and trying to find what is common among them, amongst them. And I saw that uh, structures uh, were um, uh, talking about oppressive structures and even liberating structures were the main, main issue in that, that uh, special issue. And yeah, that was our focus on our editorial. Writing like that, yeah, is making puppets talk to each other. Each paper is a talking puppet. So you basically try to create a, di a dialogue between them in your text. So you write that author A said this, author B said that. And my interpretation of the A and B's ideas is that we should look for C, something else. And that's how you understand the, the collective activity of these scientists and re design researchers trying to come up and understand something. Yeah, and and if you are reading, if you, if you are if you are a reader with that kind of mindset, you're also feeling you're part of this puppet party with so many different talking puppets and telling what are their thoughts. Because every time you grab, you cite a, an author, you impersonate that author and you say what you think the author said, but it's not exactly the author themselves talking. It's you interpreting their role. That's why I, I call that a puppet, a puppetry activity, because uh, it's it's the interpretation of the reader about what the writer wanted to convey, and that's fine to be a, uh, if you cite the reference, then the reader can go and, and look for the originals and see what, what and make up their own mind. But if you are uh, not citing or not acknowledging uh, who were the authors and what were their ideas, or you are not even including that as part of your structure of your paper, you don't get this social context that's so important to understand how this collective activity is organized. Finding out who's behind each puppet, what they are talking about, why they were doing this, the intentions behind it, political interests, and the cultural aspects of it is very important. And you can even um, make note of that while you are reading, for example, you can use color coding schemes to um, uh, underline parts that reveals the author's biography or the, the writing context. And you also can break down the different parts of the paper. Uh, sometimes I use this semantic highlighting code strategy. Uh, I use pink color for problems, gaps, certifications, hypotheses, research questions, objectives, for example, in general, uh, where what were, what were the starting points of this research? Yellow I reserve for underlining, for highlighting uh, theoretical concepts, most important uh, ideas this paper brings forth. And green is about uh, the results of what happened after the research was done, like evidence, discovery, implication, recommendations. Well, you could develop uh, uh, different ways of highlighting it. This is just an example, but after these hi uh, highlights were put on the paper, you can extract them and create, again, different ways of visualizing. This is what I typically suggest my design research students doing. So they extract those, the main uh, parts of the papers and they put them into post-its with the same color code that you have highlighted. And you can compare, for example, three articles here that are um, uh, their titles are written in this black post-its and the uh, major theoretical concepts are laid down the middle and you can see that some papers they use the same uh, theoretical concepts and then you can already start discussing them and finding out what are, what are the common threads and on, if I'm reading uh, uh, digitally which is something I avoid as much as I can uh, I will first highlight on the, on the tablet using Adobe uh, PDF Reader, Acrobat Reader, just a simple uh, app. I just highlight every time I close the PDF file, it saves on the PDF file the, the highlights and I can open that in any PDF Reader, which is very useful. But if I want to do reread again and even revise what I have written, uh, before I might need to annotate and that's not possible doing with Adobe Acrobat PF the free version and use I use another uh, app called Notable but you, there are many other apps that are suitable for this 
and in, with that Apple Pencil, I can, um, yeah, pay more attention to the text. If I'm annotating, I pay much, much more attention, uh, and I can be more uh, um, precise on my readings. But it takes longer, and I only do that if uh, it's a text that I'm investing more uh, time, especially those that I'm writing myself or writing with other co-authors. And in both uh, methods of uh, annotating annotation, the PDF files, the original PDF files are touched, and then you can I can see that in my uh, folders on the computer. I can see that my files have been touched only by visualizing them as icons. So you can see the highlights from different from uh, an overview, and then I can notice that oh, this article I have re read at least some parts of it. So I can quickly go there and check why I have done so, or I can even extract some part of that information to cite. So it's very useful to have that overview and organizing those uh, readings in different uh, folders in a nested or a structure, hierarchical structure, a classification that changes over time. That's very important, especially because I don't, if I, I recall a paper, recall an idea, I may not remember exactly what it was its, uh, its title or who are the authors, but I may remember the topic of it. And then I go back to that specific folder where it was stored and I can find the paper. And of course, I can search using some keywords, but sometimes we don't even know exactly what was the keyword, but we may know the over, pro the over topic. So it's very important to keep um, the, the, the paper, digital paper folders where I store them very tightly and organized. Because when I'm writing, if I forget to cite what I have read, I can commit accidental plagiarism. Yes, if I'm relying on someone else's ideas and I don't cite them, uh, other readers, especially reviewers or editors, they may say I'm plagiarizing other people. So I have to come back to my past readings and make sure that I'm giving proper, uh, proper uh, credit for what others have done. And if I am really serious about this, I might use another software called Zotero for reference management. Zotero has an advantage beyond uh, just storing your uh, PDFs in a blank, in a regular folder on your computer because Zotero um, stored metadata for each in entry, and then you can generate automatically a reference list using any kind of uh, format, be from uh, Chicago style to API style. You can just choose, and once you have them uh, classified in the system, you can uh, you reuse, which is something interesting as well. But I'm not a heavy user of Zotero. And another issue I have to mention that Zotero is, is an interesting, has a purpose for sharing reading. So you can share the folders with other co-authors if that's useful for them. But it takes an extra effort to classify those articles. And sometimes you lack metadata, you have to insert yourself. And one of the most important uh, tasks of citing the passwords you have read is finding the exact passage, the exact text you want to cite. Sometimes you forget. You would remember that you found the book and the book is huge, has 300 pages, you didn't take any notes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes this happens, you're reading in a hurry or you just read one part of the book, you didn't read the whole part. You want to check whether the idea repeats itself in other parts of the book. Then some people, and I myself tried out, re refer to ChatGPT for that. So I tried once uh, asking whether ChatGPT could help me find a quote from the book The Falling Sky, the Falling Sky by David Kopenhauer. And it's great that uh, ChatGPT can understand things even if we type it wrongly, like I have done here. I wrote The Falling Sky, which is odd. I probably was uh, led to error by some kind of autocomplete uh, feature of my keyboard. In any case, the ChatGPT understood I was talking about Copenhagen and Albert's book, 
and it gave, it gave me a quote. The earth has no end, but it's being destroyed by the smoke of the white people's factory. I love it then. Wow, wow, that's very critical. So I, I thought it was a, a correct one, but then I, I had the book and I searched for that exact uh, uh, quote, so it wasn't there. So ChatGPT just invented, generated that quote. <laughs> and nowadays it's getting better and uh, into avoiding that kind of uh, mistakes, but you must be quite critical about this if you're gonna use it. Uh, make sure you check everything that ChatGPT is generating for you. Uh, after trying many different ways of using ChatGPT to support my re design research writing, I found out it's kind of interesting to ask for uh, the oppressed authors that are less regarded. For example, I was writing something about uh, coloniality of making, and then I asked for other anti-colonial scholars in Peru beyond Jose, Jose, Jose Carlos Mariategui, which I knew previously, but I didn't know about other ones, so I asked ChatGPT for that, I got an interesting list. Sometimes these lists are wrongly, um, but I, I will search in other references. It's it's great to get a quick overview and some kind of uh, starting points for your search elsewhere. And uh, provided that you check its source, ChatGPT can help fill in the gaps. So you, for example, may say, hey, there are these authors here that I have already read and I have checked. Do you consider another author to be part of this group. And that's how I somehow stumbled upon the work of uh, Silver Rivera Kuzikanki through this ChatGPT interactions and while reading decoloniality literature, decolonial literature, that her name wasn't being cited very often because she was on the critical side and ChatGPT helped me to get to that uh, unheard voice. ChatGPT is mostly useful for rewriting, rephrasing and expanding existing text it's very it's less useful at generating an entirely new text so beware don't try to ask ChatGPT to write for you instead you think about ChatGPT as an active pencil that you control and sometimes you write a few sentences for you of how to complete what you're writing but then you have to recheck what has been written it's just a basic initial material for uh, your own work your own writing and if you have struggle with writing from a, in a blank page, if you don't, if you are not good on starting, and you feel like this um, uh, block, read writer's block, then one interesting way to start is by transcribing something you have said or presented, or a lecture, or a talk, or even talking to yourself. Just record it and transcribe and. Artificial intelligence technologies are quite good for that nowadays. They can really transcribe well in many different uh, accents of English. And I use Whisper AI, which is uh, from the same company that uh, designs ChatGPT. It's a very useful um, system that you can install and run locally on your computer. And if you are still feeling a lack of feedback and collaboration, uh, partnership, then go for a real person. <laughs> Don't uh, stay with an AI and co-author a paper. It's one of the best uh, best writing experience you can get because you learn so much from interacting with other people so closely. And I co-write most of my design research activities. And you can also do that in creative writing. You can uh, co-create writings and writings that have not exactly uh, initially at least uh, an academic purpose and I do that a lot with my design students and UTFPR in 2019 we wrote um, a wearable manifesto about politicizing design and that manifesto was a, a big uh, happening we, we did so many different things with that manifesto Students were so excited they decided to write a digital version of it to be more shared, to become more shareable. We used Google Drive for writing the uh, manifesto. Everyone could uh, have access to the graphic design features of Google Drive as it's usual. Everyone was allowed to change the design in a way that would uh, enrich the work. So the result of this um, manifesto design 
is breaking most of the graphic design rules that students learned throughout their study because students at that time they were pretty concerned whether they were learning something useful for their culture in Brazil or they were just colonizing Brazilian um, visual scenario or visual culture. One of these students decided to write a research paper about that experience to be published in this art design education, art design communication in higher education journal. The journal published a call for papers led by Dr. Dori Tunstall by in 2020, if I'm not wrong. Then we responded to this call and wrote a, a paper about it, about that experience of writing the manifesto into different formats. And that paper was published after a year. And it is a marvelous paper, one of the most cited papers in my own trajectory, but also very important for that student to proceed in her career, academic career. Now she's pursuing a master's degree. And as you can see, 16 art other articles have found that research useful in just a few years, which is quite impressive for someone who's talking about a topic that's typically neglected in the, in the academic uh, scenario in general. And it sparked an interest for collective design bodies, which is a topic we discuss in the paper. This monster aesthetics is something that comes out of this collective understanding of who designed and who gets designed. And participatory design is one of the fields that are interested in that. We did some quite some experiences, uh, quite some experiments in the PD Commoners Collective on designing these collective design bodies. Uh, we're still analyzing and reflecting on those experiences. But in general, what I see is that writing design research is also doing design research. It's not disconnected, right? It's not just a post uh, action activity or something you do after you're done with design research, something that is integral design research. And it can also be very cool as much as designing something. In a way, if you think deeply, every time you write about design, you also design your future design. So meta designing and not just your design. You're also designing someone else's design. People who are going to read your writing might change the way they design. And that's why it's a collective design activity too. And you are contributing uh, for changing foundational structures of design research. Like for example, all of these oppressive structures I mentioned before, all of my writing style are aimed at, well, at least my recent writings, they are aimed at um, challenging oppressive structures and helping to uh, 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 liberating designs to emerge and to get a better representation in the, in the design research scenario in general. All right, so that's these are the references for this presentation. You can check them on my website later on if you are interested in reading them. And go for it because you might get some new insights on that are different from what I had just said. My, this is just my interpretation of those readings. Thank you very much and see you in the next uh, talk.